Hi, and welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. Uh, we have a really weird episode today because everybody's remote. And so uh, we're back here on the couch, but again, everyone's remote. So, you know, it, it is how it is. Um, I'm Chris Lucian, and uh, we're joined uh, by my co-host, Austin Chadwick. And today we have joining us two uh, what I would consider experts in remote life, uh, Jason Wyman and Jason Story. So um, I didn't really think about bouncing the names around when we invited everybody. So we're going to call them Wyman and Story for the rest of the episode, but they're both Jasons. Um, so welcome to the show. And uh, maybe you each could talk about yourselves and um, how much remote you do, uh, your familiarity with mob programming, and um, I guess uh, just anything else that you have to say about it. Maybe uh, talk a little bit about the industry you, you guys are in, because uh, I think you have, you're a little unique uh, as far as our uh, guests go. So uh, maybe, uh, Wyman, we could start with you, and then we can go to story afterwards. Um, sure. So I work remote completely full-time. Uh, it's 100% of what I do, and it has been for the last probably three years or so. Before that, I spent a lot of time doing programming for games and enterprise stuff, kind of back and forth between the two and that was mostly like on-site traditional working you know just like you would a normal job and I'd occasionally work from home and um the working from home that I do now is quite a bit different I think we'll dive into that um, a lot more it changes quite a bit when you work full-time remote but most of what I do is game development and then um, also some teaching people how to build games and blogging YouTube stuff uh, a lot of that, but primarily game development and game programming with a um, medium-sized team that's all remote. And I'll let Jason go on and talk a little bit about his stuff. Sure. So um, I kind of start the same way, is that I'm full-time remote as well. Um, in my case, I do predominantly uh, consulting and contracting. And so I work with a number of different teams of varying sizes, normally in and around three to five people. And uh, they're all in different time zones. So that's, that's a bit of a entertaining struggle. Some people in England, some people in America, and I have to sort of send my, organize my own schedule around that time. But um, yeah, and so as for what I do, it's a little bit of everything. I started with enterprise stuff. So I do some .NET Core and API design and uh, full stack mean stack development. And then I'd also do Unity stuff and game stuff and AR and VR. And it really depends what people are willing to pay me to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's very good. Um, so I think the number one uh, um, thing that pops out to me is, while, while I'm kind of interacting with you over video right now is that you both have very interesting backgrounds and setups for your remote work. So um, I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there transitioning to remote right now just because of the current uh, times. Um, so uh, what, what advice do you have for people um, regarding technology, um, comfort, just what the hardware involved in general for people that are starting to work remote today? Oh, oh well, I would start with um, a couple things. I think a lot of time people start with like the chair and the desk and making sure that's all comfortable. Um, I think that's important, but not as important as making sure that the system that you're working on is extremely fast. Um, that, you know, assuming that you're doing development, we're talking about remote software development, programming, game stuff, um, or non-game stuff, make sure that you have a very good development environment set up locally, the fastest thing that you can get, uh, best keyboard and mouse and all that kind of stuff, and the screens that you need. And then I'd say work towards um, more comfortable key, uh, chairs and desks and stuff. I think that most people are just going to find a chair that they are okay with, but get the hardware first because really like the, having slow hardware at home when you're working remote kills things and it leads to a lot of distractions. I mean, and I think the, the value is kind of understated because when you have slow stuff at home and you're working remote, you're all by yourself. If you're waiting for a build or you're waiting for something to finish, it's extremely easy to just get distracted and go down another hole. So getting rid of that, that pause there, especially when there's nobody around to hold you accountable and push you back onto task. Um, not, not being forced to be distracted because you're sitting there waiting 10 minutes for something to happen or even a minute for something to happen is, uh, I think, really important. Right on. And then having fancy stuff in the background that just looks cool. Yeah. That, that's important too. Must so that's have. mostly for YouTube stuff. But to be honest, I really like having it back there now because now I walk in, I wake up, I walk down into my office and it just like looks like an interesting, fun place 
full of random fun things that I saw that I thought were kind of cool when I was out. <laughs> yeah, hey, you sorry, actually touched on you, you touched on my answer already, Jason. As I was going to say, aside from the obvious chair, always get a good chair. Uh, I'm I'm personally a fan of the Herman Miller stuff. This is an embody at the moment. Um, but the main two that I would say are really important is one, uh, because I consider it good practice to treat your home office like an office, almost like you're getting up and going to work with a really small commute. Uh, I really like to make a point of isolating the rest of the house. And so a good pair of headphones to me is, is paramount. So finding something that will block out other noises because you really do want to treat your office like it's a isolated space to get work done. But the second thing was basically what Jason just said is I spent the first, I'd say, three years of working at home against a bare wall, just a, a boring office. I didn't unpack much. I just treated it like a room with a desk in it. And uh, I cannot really express how much better it feels to set up your office so it's somewhere you enjoy being. It feels like a place that you can actually relax in and it sort of represents your personality. And myself and Jason both do some YouTube stuff. So it, it kind of, it helps lean into that territory by having a lot of interesting things behind you. But honestly, I didn't do it for that. I did it because I enjoy my office now. I like taking a breath and just rotating my chair around and poking at the various things I picked up for myself as sort of a nice, uh, comfortable environment. So I actually do think that's surprisingly important. Find things you enjoy and surround yourself with them. It genuinely improves your mood when you're sitting at home in your home office. Yeah, I noticed that recently. Um, so, uh, you know, Austin and I have transitioned to remote re recently. And uh, so for the last three days, we've been working this way. And um, because I had my office kind of set up that way, I have board games and things along those lines. Everybody can see in the show right now. Um, it's been nice because I, it also provides some character and humanization when I'm talking to coworkers that have never seen the inside of my house before. And so uh, I've gotten comments on the background and things like that um, as well. And that provides a, a area for conversation, which has been really an interesting side effect of all this. Um, the background I'm behind right now is uh, uh, maybe a lot less interesting at the moment. And I, I, I can, I can, feel it it's kind of palpable when i'm interacting with you over here versus when i'm in my normal office um yeah right on yeah and uh i second what chris is saying and uh i think one follow-up question i have um as a part uh, from setup is uh can you guys talk about your uh collaboration patterns for your remote work and how you uh collaborate with others and uh, what you've seen work well and not work well when you need to uh, collaborate with others remotely. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in first, I guess. So like I said, my experience is remote is mostly, or at least my current experience remote working is mostly with a team that's, I'd say medium sized. The engineering team is like five, ranging between five and seven people, depending on the, the month. And then the rest of the team, you know, 30 ish. Uh, most communication is directly with the engineering team and the design team. And the way the, the things that we use that work best tend to be just um, actual live Skype calls. Um, and we use Skype over everything. I, I per, for personally, I prefer some other tools, but we use Skype for everything and um, doing live voice chat or even better when we can do the video chats works really well to work through stuff. And it's not just, um, just voice and video, but also the screen sharing and actually going through and showing exactly what we're doing as we're building it and what we're thinking either on screen, like mocked up and prototyped in game or dragging things around and kind of adjusting live in, in the editor, which is kind of like um, doing a web page design live um, or um, like mockups that are drawn on paper, a lot of hand drawn stuff that gets uh, taken picture pictures taken or scans or something and then sent around to convey the ideas of what it is we're trying to do and again it's a lot of game design stuff and implementation of the game design so it's a lot about understanding what it is that the end user or the the product manager which is a game designer in this case actually wants um so those live calls and then we uh we bounce around between a couple different tracking systems uh now on to devops um and it's always been a struggle to find a really good system that, that I, at least that I've found for us that um, works really well for tracking these kinds of things and managing that stuff. So we, we still use that, but it's essentially, yeah, mostly Skype meetings and Skype calls cool. and a lot of just constant communication. Like I, I feel like if we're talking, we need to be talking almost every day. 
No, if not every day, ideally every day, but most remote teams I know talk like once a week. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Which is kind of a surprise. I've seen a lot of the time where remote teams, like they'll sync up once and that's it. That's the end of it. And then like they'll hear from each other a week later or something. Yeah. Maybe one follow-up question for uh, Wyman before jumping to story, which is, so we, as Chris said, we've transitioned to remote. And since we were full-time uh, mob programming before, uh, we just jumped into that. So it's video call all day long and we're looking at the same IDE or the same virtual Kanban board and we're talking to that. One tip you just had that was interesting where you, you draw something and then take a picture of it and then show it on the computer. That's something I hadn't thought of before. Um, but for you who's not uh, necessarily mobbing or even full time, uh, what initiates the collaboration for you remotely? Is it like a scheduled meeting? Is it... Hey, I had a question. You just call somebody. Yeah. There, there are a couple scheduled meetings just to make sure. And I think the, the biggest benefit there is that anybody who's um, been unable to sync up with somebody for some reason, yeah, because we have the same issues Jason had with time zones. There's people all across the, the planet, right? As far as Australia and I don't know, I, I, all over. But yeah. um. Uh, the majority of the actual valuable communication, I think, is more impromptu stuff. It's as we're working on things, we'll hop into these calls. And we will occasionally do, um, when, it's, when it's collaboration with the other programmers, we'll do a lot of screen sharing and pairing and stuff. Um, not mobbing. Uh, I'd still love to get mobbing like adopted. I found it to be a lot harder with a completely remote team. Um, I feel like if you're in person, like you can just kind of bring everybody to the spot with a completely remote team, like getting everybody in and consistently doing it is hard, but I've been able to do it a little bit. Um, every now and then we're able to just hop in or when we need to do a big feature or a big refactor of an important system. So we want to make a big change to a system. Uh, a lot of time what we'll do then is pair and mob. Um, and that may be like an all day long thing. A lot of times my folks come get me you know, two in the morning. You still, still at it. What are you doing? I thought this meeting was over at noon. Yeah. Right, right, right on. Okay, cool. So it's kind of more of a, you know, as needed, I have a question or oh, I need to work something out. You pull people together remotely. And, and it's really common though. I mean, it's not like a, pull people together but it only happens like you know once every other day and this is like a constantly mess if it's it's either text chat or skype calls <laughs> and uh while, while we do mob full-time there's this is a no judgment zone right you know so whatever works in your context is fantastic mobbing would work best i think <laughs> <laughs> but hey no. all, all right, right. So the other part is with the time zones it does make the mobbing kind of hard because some people are just asleep when other people are awake you know? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So turning it over to story, what are your uh, collaboration patterns uh, remotely? Well, I've noticed for the most part, there's two kinds of projects I'll work on. So I'll either be brought in for a two, three month period to work on something. And it's usually sort of uh, a precursor to an event. So like going to a GDC or going to some, um, some showroom and somebody wants a project done. They don't give you much lead time. They basically say, I need this thing. I need it in two months. Let's get it done. Here's your team of four people. And then the other kind would be more an ongoing uh, project, which might last a year or two, and where it's a member of the team. When it's a long-running project, um, I almost always make a point of doing daily stand-ups where possible. Now, it gets a bit tough when you're working with two or three teams and you're trying to do three daily stand-ups a day for three different teams. <laughs> but I do my best to maintain that because I find there's a, a sense of... Um, it, it feels like you're, you're buying into the team if you do that. If you don't, it feels like you could potentially be a, someone contracting off to the side that sort of pops in from time to time. And I like to let people know that I'm, I'm there, I'm part of this project. And so I'm part of your daily stand up for your team. Um, then for the other projects, it tends to be a lot more about uh, weekly catch ups. And if it's more sort of like week long sprints where we do, we do meet up every week and we sort of say, are we still on track? Is everyone still know what they're doing? And we just, we try to cut out meetings just purely because we want to get things done. And usually that's a lot of uh, running around like headless chickens. As for tools we use, uh, I used to use a lot of Skype and I find lots of people still call me on Skype, but wherever possible, I personally prefer to use Zoom or BlueJeans because I find I've got bad internet here. I've got about 30 megabytes. So it's, it's quite bad for long-term uh, video streaming. 
And so if I'm doing screen shares, I've noticed it gets very blurry and hard to share things like code, which doesn't really have a lot of contrast. But I've noticed Zoom, for me at least, gives me a far better, clearer picture than Skype does for that kind of a thing. Um, they're the tools I would normally use. And then it, other than that, I don't have a lot of say because I basically am moving into the uh, company culture that's there. I will often, if, if they don't have tools, I will often recommend tools. I will say we should have a Trello board or we should have, you know, a Jira set up or something. Or I will say, definitely use source control. We need Git. But for the most part, <laughs> um, you'd be surprised how many people don't even have source control set up. But for the most part, I'll lean into whatever the team is using, right? So I've worked on teams where they have confluence and they're using their own, you know, knowledge base. I've used other teams where they actually use hack and plan. I don't know if you've heard of that one. That's for kind of more game development stuff. Uh, Trello was quite common for small studios. And then what's really growing traction now for me is a lot of people are using uh, mind mapping boards. And what's that one? I forgot the name of it, but there's this really nice board uh, tool that I've seen a few people use. Um, I, I saw one called Mind Mup. That was one that I tried. Um, a couple of other ones, but yeah, M I N D M U P. Um, but if you think about it, Jason, um, just let us know and we'll put it in the show notes. So just send me a URL. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing I experimented with today, um, uh, this morning actually, was this idea of a water cooler conversation. Um, and so we're using Microsoft Teams and you can put a video chat on a channel and anybody can join. And so uh, we kind of do this morning check-in on the chat. And so I basically ask like, what type of breakfast are you? Or what type of car are you today and why? And then uh, a bunch of people reply. And then I also put up a video chat that anybody could join and just talk about whatever uh, in the very beginning of the day. Because um, what I noticed is that I had a lot of conversations around the coffee machine um, that were immediately missing. So just just to you know, the daily stand up makes sense, but it was kind of like a, an informal version of that. Um, I don't know how long that'll last, but it's just an experiment to note here. I, I miss that the most, by the way. Of all of the things I miss about working in an office, I used to do a nine to five at a bank, so I, I've done that life as well for a few years, <laughs> and uh, I genuinely miss the water cooler. And it was like it was a genuine, you know, non metaphorical actual water cooler. We we would kind of peek over the heads of all the desks and see who's itching to take a break and we'd all sneak over and have a, have a bit of a chat. And it really was a nice cathartic break during the day. And I find that that is genuinely missing out of a, a remote sort of setup. Yeah, I would say it was very successful to do the re remote version of that um, because, and all, all the stuff that's happening in the news today, it was just an interesting thing because we kind of just like worked out kind of a, a little bit of that early morning anxiety. And then I think everybody right afterwards was more ready to get to work. So it was an interesting thing. A little bit of social time built into the schedule was kind of a, a, a different way to go about it. Um, I like that idea I, a lot. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so it was successful for one day. I'll let you know uh, how, it, how it keeps going. Well, one um, of the teams I work with, they have a plan that was there before I got there, which seems to be quite successful, is they have themed days. So we do our daily stand-ups and every day is sort of like Motivational Monday and Terminology Tuesday and so on. And that we basically go around and everybody prepares one or two lines of a funny anecdote or something interesting. Um, and we, it's sort of like a, a similar idea, right? It starts your day with some sort of informal, get everybody in a more casual working mood, you know, and it, that seems to work quite well. Nice. Yeah, actually, so um, I guess that's a follow up question that I have for both of you is um, what type of like quirky things or something like maybe maybe uh, because you're, you're both have been at different companies remotely. Um, are there things that the companies have used in your experience to keep people engaged or emotionally stable or anything along those lines from kind of uh, kind of getting rid of that uh, social isolation that it kind of naturally occurs? Um, not a lot for me, for the at least not on the remote side. Like the the biggest thing is just occasional in person meetings. Occasionally, we'll get together at um, people get together either at events, which obviously aren't happening right now, right? <laughs> or in person in the office, which is a smaller subset. But occasionally, we do that, and it's mostly just for that connection. Um, other than that, the only other thing I found that works really well, and most places still don't do it, is just having the damn cameras on like having yeah. cameras up and visible so you can see people's faces you can see if they're engaged or if you're boring them to death with a two-person conversation with 10 people there just sitting there waiting for it to end so they can <laughs> continue working or get whatever is done um like and usually it's not that bad but you know, you get the 
I feel like you get a lot better context and just um, relatability and an understanding of who people are when you get into the video realm, right? Like text is kind of the lowest, you're sending messages back and forth. It's really easy to hate the person on the other end of the text, right? <laughs> like the email, the, the damn person in uh, you know, accounting or whatever it is that, that keeps messing stuff up. But then you talk to them on the phone, it's like one step better. They might still irritate you and you know, it's kind of hard. And once you get into video, it gets a lot harder to, it's so much more like face to face that it's easier to give people, I think, the benefit of the doubt and just um, work together better when you, when you have it on. So most companies, I wouldn't say do it, but it's what I would recommend people do. Um, yeah, um, I, I've kind of, in this transition, I've been doing a camera on always, and I've, I already noticed it made a couple people uncomfortable, but then two days later, they all turned on their cameras right away. So I, I found that modeling behavior actually has, has started to um, have side effects throughout the organization. Because I, I think everybody instinctually just went to no camera right away. Uh, so that was really interesting. And I've been trying to do that too. I just default the camera on and I'm like the weirdo with the, the camera on. But occasionally people will copy and, and follow and hop in and like one or two people will join me. So try, oh. trying to push that as much as possible. And just I only flip it down if the wife pops in or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, have, have you guys ever done uh, retrospectives or anything like that online? Are there any tool recommendations? We've been experimenting a little bit with that. Um, and so I, I don't know if you can talk to this idea of like holding and facilitating well facilitated meetings or retrospectives using online tools. I'm gonna let um, story go with that one. To be honest, no, like I've actually noticed there's a lot that there's sort of um a lot of the projects that I've worked on, they're very lacking in um, formal tooling of any kind. Like I, I, I've noticed that it tends to be, uh, aside from whatever chat client they're using, the majority of teams don't really have any structure or, or pretty much anything. It becomes like, it's often sharing Word documents, it's sharing Excel documents, it's emailing back and forth. And I've noticed that it, even procedures, like there's not much in the way of uh, stand-ups and that kind of thing in general. It tends to be more here's a project meeting, here's the rough idea we're going for. And I'm always the one who, who sort of pushes for even something as simple as. Uh oh. Cut out. We lost. Yeah. Oh, am I, am I still here? You're back. Uh, yeah, you cut out for a little bit. Uh, that's, keep going. That's my, that's my low quality internet I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah so I, I'm usually the one who pushes for something as simple as uh, requirements documents. Like I've noticed that it, it tends to be very informal and I'm, I usually like to make sure everybody signs off on the same unit of work, which is even a rare occurrence. So, so no, not from my experience, very, very few of um, the companies have that sort of procedures in place, but to answer your other question regarding sort of interesting things that are done uh, and the, the whole use of cameras. One thing that I thought was very cool is one of the companies I worked for, they, they wanted to do like a video uh, blog of the progress of the project. So they asked everybody once every two weeks to just record themselves for a minute or two talking about their day. And it doesn't have to be the project specifically. They had a nice sheet of, you can talk about what's going on in the news. You can talk about your own hobbies and interests. Oh, and I, just... I found that was really engaging because they'd put it up on a Google shared drive and you could go in and just watch four minutes of one of the people on the team that you wouldn't normally converse with, talk about something fun they do. Like one person was talking about the fact that they do improv, improv comedy. And it's like, that's never come up but it's a fascinating thing to learn about somebody. And it means the next time you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can start up a conversation about things that you have in common and things you like. And it's, it's sort of, it eases that gap that Jason was talking about where you sort of, you, you vilify somebody who's uh, causing you difficulties in a technical realm across the email, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I really like that idea a lot. Yeah, and actually to uh, yes and do a couple of things you guys were saying, um, and then I'll turn it over to Chris, because I think he did a really interesting experiment along the lines of lean coffees uh, from a remote perspective. Um, so you're talking about sharing the three or four minute video uh, with each other and then posting them somewhere. I'll have to look up the app name, uh, but my wife and kids were doing it with their friends that they no longer can have a play date with. And what it does is it's like an app where you record a video and then it like sends it and it's almost like a ping pong back and forth. So it's like, Hey, here's my day. Here's how it's going. And this is what we're doing. And then you send it and then the person will watch it whenever they have time and then they'll record their own video and send it back. Um, so I'll have to get the app name, but it kind of reminded me of that and maybe would uh, reduce, remove some of the 
barriers on having a share site and making sure people mm. read that kind of thing. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that, so we do lightning talks normally. So I, I think what I'm going to ask is if people want to record their lightning talk coming up, um, maybe we publish that internally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. So what I was going to say, I was going to yes and to the stand up. Uh, so while we are full time remote mob programming, um, the, uh, one, we were not mob programming all day with the product owner, at least right now. And so uh, the daily standup has proved to be very useful. And uh, I just want to take the spirit of what some of you guys said, like not just jumping right in, but saying like, hey, how's your day going? And the video really helps make it more personal. Um, and uh, we actually experienced the pain of what you're talking about. We were texting back and forth with him on the chat system and that was very painful. And then we had a voice call and then we did video. And then we did video with sharing a Kanban board, a virtual Kanban board. And we could talk about like, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing next. Um, you know, and here are the questions we had. We put our questions on the Kanban board uh, that we couldn't get a hold of them with earlier. So that was very helpful. Um, and then one thing that uh, I'll turn it over to Chris because I thought, um, uh, oh, and the app name, <laughs> talking about help, my wife just came in and gave the name of the app. It's uh, Marco Polo <laughs> is the name of the app that we ping pong videos back and forth. Yeah. Um, so Chris, do you mind sharing about uh, what you did earlier in this week with the, uh, you had, you did a bit of basically a virtual lean coffee. You did one with the entire group of developers and you did one with a group of product owners. Do you mind sharing about that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so there've been people on the team and uh, maybe we, we, we probably should uh, get some others on the show to talk a little bit about some of these ideas that, that I got from others. But um, uh, so one of these things was uh, I was just looking for a place to host cards and a member of the team said um, idea boards, B-O-R-D-Z, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, but we went there and we were able to kind of uh, host a lean coffee that way. So you can create sticky notes and, um, and basically people can type in and we had a 26 person lean coffee and it went awesome. A um, couple things that we, we had was, um, so, so everybody did the sticky notes um, and a lean coffee. It's, it's a format for facilitating conversations and we'll probably put a link for a, a video explanation of that. Um, but uh, what was cool about it was uh, we started using Microsoft Teams um, reaction feature. So uh, I think this is probably a similar thing in Slack, but um, this idea that you can react to a, a post and then also posting emojis. So whenever somebody wanted to speak next, they, they'd post a, an emoji in the chat and then, and then you kind of bring that and use that to, to call out people uh, in order. Um, and then uh, also using emojis to also vote on whether or not to go forward or end a portion of the conversation. And so we used a combination of tools to have to facilitate this 26 person meeting. And, um, and we, we, we just kind of clipped along really quickly and it was a really, really cool, had a lot of great side effects. Um, we explained the ideas to each other, 30 seconds each, uh, voted on an idea, um, and then talked five minutes at a time and then, and then voted whether or not we should continue the conversation. So in, in about an hour, we covered five, six topics uh, in well enough, enough depth to allow everyone who wanted to speak on them to speak on. And it was, it, it went really well. So, um, yeah, I don't know, that, that whole meeting could, the format could probably take a whole episode. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really interesting. I've got it pulled up now, I wanna try it out. I wish you could just record it and release one of those. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, well um, you know, one of these days, I, I think we could probably do something where we get a bunch of people from the community together and we just do a lean coffee um, and we can just do a remote lean coffee episode together. And maybe we get, you know, five, six more people on the call and, uh, and we try and do it. So maybe look, look for that. Maybe we can do that next week. That could be fun. Be an interesting thing. All right. Um, we're, we're approaching our, our time box here. Um, is there uh, any other topics that we want to cover before we sign off? Um, there is one thing I'd like to bring up, which is because it, it seems to be a little bit different from uh, the rest of your experience, is that from my, the context that I'm in, I'm often uh, brought in into a pre-existing team, whether or not they use various um, sort of uh, patterns of practices is kind of irrelevant, but either way, it kind of feels like I'm on the side and I have to ingratiate myself into a company culture that's different from, from cause they're, they're not used to having me in it. Um, and just one bit of advice that I usually like to give to people is if you find yourself in that position where you're in a team that's, that they all know each other, but they don't know you, 
um, I make a point of asking if I can have a 10 minute meeting or 15 minute meeting with every member of the team and just ask what they do. What is their day like and have a bit of a conversation with them. And, and what's really good about that is not only do you get to know what everyone's kind of position is, but it gives them time to get to know you without having to kind of go through a lot more of the um, kind of the slow burn of, of meeting each other. And uh, I've, I've found it really cuts out a lot of potential conflict that you're going to get later on. And not to mention, it also helps you very quickly identify where people might be struggling, where some people, there might be some internal conflict where some people are kind of louder than others in a team. And because you have a third party perspective, you can come in and see who the boisterous characters are and who are the quieter people. And you can sort of get ideas from people and then sort of try to, to flatten that kind of curve between everybody if, if they feel like they don't want to speak up internally, right? So it's just a bit of a tip that I'd have from my experience with different small teams. Nice. Yeah, actually, uh, that reminds me of a training I did a long time ago with uh, Esther Derby and Don Gray. And they, they put this, um, they basically had, had this idea of what's called center, enter, turn. Whenever you join a new team, kind of center yourself and then become part of the team. And only then do you really start suggesting things to like change the way they work, because otherwise you'll be met with a lot of resistance. Right. So I think that's what you're talking to a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, jumping in and changing things is always bad. I wanted to um, just briefly touch on the difference between working from home full time, though, or permanently versus um, the occasional just like working from home day, too, because I, yeah. I feel like I, a lot of people might be making that transition right now. And um, it's a little bit it can be a little bit rough and a little bit different because I, I feel like a lot of the time when you work from home with, with my finger quotes, Right. A lot of the time what happens is people will stay home that day. It, it tends to be like, I'm sick. You know, the first couple of times tend to be like, I'm sick. So I'm just going to work from home. They get the bare minimum amount of stuff done. They reply to a couple of emails. Um, and it's fine because it was one day, right? It was one day out of the week and it didn't really make a big impact. But as soon as you're working from home full time, suddenly you become really accountable for, um, the deliverables and the things that you have to get done. So you have a list of stuff to get done and you're no longer measured by like whether or not you came into the office and were nice to everybody. Right. And, and did some <laughs> con con contributions there. You're measured by like what you commit, right? It's, it's what, what did you commit? How did that work? How did everything go? So you have to be, I'd say a little bit more disciplined in the way that things go or the, the work that you do. And also remember that, um, uh, your guys' scenario is a little bit different because you're mobbing and you're constantly like live collaborating. But for most people working from home, they're going to be somewhat more relaxed on their schedule. They're going to be working somewhat on their own time because everybody else is too. And uh, it's important to realize that like when you work from home full time, like you're always at work, right? Like there, there's never a time when you're not at work and it's very easy to mix the two and kind of always be working or never be yeah. working um and it's it's a hard thing to balance to make sure that you don't go too far in one direction and i find myself constantly swaying back and forth like doing too much work and too little work and having to balance it constantly because it, it's just it's very easy to get distracted but it's also very easy to just dive in and work for 16 hours straight and not realize it because you just went go right back to bed <laughs> I think that second part is often, <clears throat> excuse me, is that second part you mentioned is often the overlooked portion. A lot of people think if you work from home, they're sort of afraid that the person working from home won't get anything done. But the opposite can be true as well, where you're sitting at your desk that's normally your home entertainment space, and it's now your office at the same time. And you can find yourself falling into bad habits of constantly ebbing and flowing between work and like in the middle of watching a TV show, closing it and doing some code and then opening it again. And, and you end up not being able to escape that. And that's why I strongly advise to pick a room in your house and make it an office and separate it if you can. If you can't do that, treat it like you're going to work. Literally put on the outfit that you would normally wear to work, even if, you, even if you're not leaving the house. Sit down, set the clock as if you are, and actively go through your same process you normally would. And that's not just for the company's benefit. So it's not just, you're not just doing it for the sake of the team you're working with. You're doing it for yourself because if you know you've done your best and worked hard for that time period, you can clock out and then have your free time and not feel obliged to sort of poke at the work again because you're still at your computer. So I will actively like time box and stop working, even though there's stuff I want to do, I will make a note and I won't do it. I'll be at the computer, but I'll force myself not to just keep adding it to the rest of my day. It's probably a good idea. I don't follow that at all. And you know, <laughs> I'm usually in my underwear or my, my pajamas or something, but um, I think it's probably good advice there from the story. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I, that, that was one thing that I, I kind of uh, set out to do in the last three days was basically just complete my entire morning routine, um, get dressed in the same thing I get dressed in every day and, uh, and, and work that way. And that's been really helpful. Um, I also found that uh, in the last three days, I've been interrupted a lot less. And so I'm actually ending the day a lot more tired because I'm getting, I'm, I'm, getting a lot of thought, more thought work done um, than I normally would have. Uh, and I'm not maybe walking from place to place to talk to people. It's like, end this call, open that call. And all of a sudden, I've uh, that two or three minute break of walking that I would have gotten is has disappeared now. And so uh, last few days, I've been ending completely, like, totally exhausted. Um, so it's been interesting. I think we, we kind of skipped over that too. And it's an important thing that um, when you work from home full time, the distractions, unless you have a lot of distractions in your home, the distractions from coworkers almost completely disappear. The, hey, let's go for a walk to the get a drink because I'm thirsty and I don't want to walk alone. Or, hey, let's uh, go, go get lunch. Or, hey, you ready to go get lunch? Or, hey, let's go talk. Or, hey, I want to ask you about this thing. And it turns into an hour long conversation about something totally unrelated in your office. This just don't generally happen. And if they do happen, uh, if you do end up having these off conversations, you're working while you're doing it because you're just sitting at your desk coding. And uh, you, you can do those kind of as a side thing, but they don't really happen in the distraction. I'd say they almost completely die and disappear also the impromptu hey everybody let's go to this meeting room and talk about something that only one of you really has any <laughs> any impact on yeah. does disappear too mm. but yeah, you do yeah, have yeah. to counter that you have dogs and you have deliveries and you have family and you have other things <laughs> uh, in, in my case there's not as much of that it, mostly it's deliveries you know you have to deal with people coming to the door and various things happening that you wouldn't normally be dealing with in a work day and that's why, again, I go back to the good headphones. Get something that lets you focus on what you're doing for the time period you're working. Entirely, yeah, absolutely. Some serious first world problems. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Too many deliveries. <laughs> <laughs> too many people want to bring me things. <laughs> okay, um, I, I want to prevent this from going too long, um, but right. uh, um, we can definitely record another episode. I think the Lean Coffee will be a really great thing to do. So uh, keep an eye out, everybody, for that. Um, do you guys have anything you want to plug? Uh, we, we, we talk a lot about craftsmanship here. I know you both are working on craftsmanship-related stuff. So um, maybe, Wyman, you could start and, and uh, story we can go in and, and either stuff that you might have coming up or you have out there already. Um, you know, I, I'm sure our audience would be happy to hear about it. Sure. So I've got a YouTube channel. It's just my name, Jason Wyman on YouTube. Uh, it's all about game development and uh, design patterns, solid principles, that kind of stuff, and just general game development. So it's kind of, a, I guess it's a bit of a mix. Um, all of those things in the context of game development, plus all of the standard, like how to make a game for a beginner and all that. Also a uh, website, game.courses, where I have some courses on game development and um, an upcoming conference sometime in, I think, May, where we'll talk about game development in depth and Jason will be there and Chris will be there and uh, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, that's all I got. Awesome. How about you, Jason? Story? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I also have a YouTube channel that is my name, Jason Story. Uh, there's nothing on it just yet. It's currently in production as we speak. Uh, but to tide you over, I, I have a weekly um, hour long kind of video podcast where we talk about game development on another channel, uh, Infallible Code. So uh, you can catch me over there once a week talking just generally about answering Q&A questions for people who want to sort of get into game development as a, as a career and sort of general tips and best practices for architecture in video games. Awesome. Well, thank you both uh, for being on the show and we'll, we'll put links to those in the show notes. Um, Austin, do you have anything more? No, no, not at all. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate you guys' time. The, your resources are excellent. I've looked into some of them. Um, and one other show note I'll add is uh, your like evening shutdown was like almost, I don't know if you've heard of the book, uh, Deep Work, uh, Jason's story, but you were almost quoting it with the uh, evening shutdown idea where uh, before you end the day, you write down what you're going to do next. Um, and it'll allow you to shut your work brain off and then go into home mode kind of thing. So I'll put a link in the show notes for that as well. But other than that, uh, like and subscribe for, to the Mob Mentality Show. Uh, it was excellent having the, the Jason Squared with us. And uh, please share this video with anybody uh, you think could, uh, uh, you know, uh, it would help them with their remoting. 
And until then, remote well, and we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. Bye, everybody.